Welcome to the Open Forum. Once again, we have the opportunity to look together into the Word of God to discover truth. And how wonderful it is that as if we follow the rules of the Bible, Christ spoke in parables, and without a parable he did not speak. That means that while the Bible is a book of spiritual truth, it teaches spiritual truth, but it is uh, hidden uh, in a great many ways by historical uh, things that did happen, and we have to uh, see once what the, uh, these are parables, that is, we have to look for the heavenly meaning or the spiritual meaning to these earthly events, uh, because the focus finally of the whole Bible is spiritual. Uh, when it's talking about clean and unclean foods, for example, the book, uh, the Bible is not a diet book. It's not telling us that certain kinds of meat is better than other kinds of meat. It is simply using two kinds of meat, clean and unclean animals, and God specifies what he wants to be considered clean and what to be considered unclean in order to teach a spiritual lesson. And until we find that spiritual truth that comes from that, uh, that historical command, we haven't really understood what the Bible is talking about. But thank you. this program is designed to offer you the opportunity to call in and share, and uh, share your question, and shall we take our first call tonight, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, how are you, Mr. Tampin? Very well, thank you. Okay, can we look at uh, Ephesians 4, verse 26? Ephesians 4, verse 20. Six. Let's look at that. Ephesians 4, verse 26. Yes. There we read, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Well, this. Uh, what is your question about this? Well, it's just like before you go to bed, just, you know, like clear everything, you know, make everything positive, you know, be not angry, you know, just, you know, if you're having disputes or anything, you should just end it at that, you know, before you go to sleep, you know, so it doesn't carry on, you know, from day after day. Well, you know, uh, God is angry, but it's a righteous anger. He is... He is angry because people, when they sin, they are rebelling against the law which God has given them. That law was given them for their good so that they might enjoy life more in this world. And yet, when, when we sin, we are hurting ourselves and we are rebelling against God and so God has righteous anger. But when you and I become angry, Watch out. Ninety-nine and nine-tenths percent of the time, I don't think that's too big an exaggeration. We become angry because of a sin in our own life. We are impatient, or we feel threatened, or we, uh, uh, or we, uh, whatever. There's, there, if we think about it, why did I become so angry when uh, this happened or that happened? And you'll find that it isn't because I was trying to live a life that was pleasing to God and I was walking very humbly. It means that my pride was hurt or, or I uh, felt like someone got in my way and they shouldn't have. And, uh, and uh, I just was impatient. And, and uh, so uh, to be angry and sin not is a virtual impossibility for a person. We might consider the idea I get angry with myself when I sin and uh, and th th that that might be valid although uh, what the, the remedy is that we go to the Lord and oh Lord have mercy uh, could it be that you'll guide me that you'll work in my life 
so that I will do your will and O oh Lord forgive uh, my my uh, sin and uh, even then there uh, the 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 answer is not that I'm angry with myself because I sinned but I really uh, uh, well maybe I ought to be angry with myself because I didn't go to the Lord to help me but that's about the only way we could look at it the idea to be angry and sin not but thank you like having a grudge uh, well if we have a grudge against someone that's that is a sin in itself we are to forgive each other we're not to carry resentment against someone else we are being we can be sinned against again again and again and again uh, but the Bible teaches when Christ was reviled he reviled not again we don't we should not carry a grudge that is a sinful action and thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum hi good evening mr camping thank you for taking my call sir yes um i have a question about jonah 310 and in particular i'm, I'm very grateful you're working on new tracks and in particular as it appears described in the new judgment day track jo jonah 310 yeah is the verse you want to look at right all right let's look at that Jonah 3.10, there we read, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Now, what is your question? Well, I'm curious about it, because right after that, in, in the tract, and I'm trying to understand this, because I understood um, the Ninevites as representing... Um, a parable, I think, representing salvation today, and I may be I might be wrong about that. But the reason why I was in particular curious because right after that, you you write in in the tract um, you write because this entire wicked city of Nineveh turned from their evil ways and with great humility cried to God for mercy. Holy God did change His mind and did not destroy them. So I was curious about the because nature of that because if if it is a parable of salvation. Shouldn't it be not because, but they did glorify God by, by having humility, but it wasn't because they turned from their evil ways? It or am not, I getting to it? it we, let's remember this. We, God has written the Bible in a, such a way that we can get confused as to really what is salvation. Like, for example, in the book of Acts, chapter 16, when, when uh, the... Uh, jailer at Philippi said sirs what must I do to become saved and then Peter said I believe or Paul uh, I guess it was Paul I said believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved well as that sentence stands it seems as plain as day that if I believe if I will begin to trust in the Lord I'm on the path towards salvation but when we read that in the light of the whole Bible, we know that is not true, because believing is a work that we do, and we can't be saved by any work that we do. Uh, the fact is that if we, if God, uh, uh, God only saves those that He chose from before the foundation of the world and actually made payment for their sins before the foundation of the world, but then at some point, he has to apply that salvation, and that is uh, at the point that uh, that uh, we we do become saved, and all the work is done by Christ, of course. And yet, we still have salvation that we're waiting on, and that is, we're waiting on our resurrected bodies. And now, once we uh, once we have become a child of God then we do believe and uh, we do trust in the Lord and uh, and uh, that is a work that we do and but the, uh, there again our salvation is completed or the uh, the, uh, uh, the work of, uh, of redemption is completed because God has to do all of it and so here too when God saw their works it doesn't mean that this 
gave God a reason to save them. They obviously were saved. They were their sins had been paid for before he ever created the world. Uh, but he is indicating that this is pleasing to God that we come to him with a broken and a contrite heart. And, uh, and it's possible, it is possible that we might become, we might become saved, not because we have a broken and a contrite heart, but because, uh, 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 it is because God has chosen us from the foundation of the world. And that's all very mysterious. But there's nothing that we, like the Ninevites, what they did did not cause their salvation. It just happened to be what they did was fit into place into what a true believer would have done. And even they recognize maybe God will change his mind. They realize that their their work of coming with a contrite heart to the Lord and crying out for mercy, that would not save them in itself. But thank you. Uh, Mr. Camping, sir? Mr. Camping? Yes. I was curious, though, might the wording, though, be then, in, I, 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 forgive me for saying this, but might the wording then be improved, though, in the track? Because the way the track reads, it, it, in the very exact way you describe that it's not because of something we do, um, that the track kind of directly reads, though, as if it's because they turn from their sins. And, and so I was just wondering if, if perhaps there might be a better wording there, because it, it then does, of course, you do say that God might turn and repent, but still, if that follows from because, it's still a, a cause and effect in a way, in that because you, because they repented, God might, or because they repented, God will. But either way, writing it as because, I was just, I was curious, because I'm looking forward to giving out this tract, and, and when I read that, it kind of, um, I, I know, I, I understand your teaching, I think, but um, the way it was worded, I was just curious if you might want to look at that again. Yeah, well, I could, but you know... Like, for example, in Zephaniah chapter 2, uh, verse 3, Seek ye the Lord, seek ye Jehovah, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of Jehovah's anger. You see, uh, it, it always, that is a condition that there's nothing we can do to get ourselves saved, but we, uh, God is pleased when we turn to Him, when we cry out for mercy, but that is not meeting any condition uh, that is required that we might become saved, even though God might be pleased with that. And because He's pleased with that, uh, that, doesn't, that means that maybe He might save us, and He'll only save us if indeed He had already saved us, before the foundation of the world, so it's there. It's it's very hard to uh, put it down in the, in the uh, in the most easily understandable language. But uh, the fact is that uh, we must always remember we might become saved. We have no guarantee. That is the point. We have no guarantee that because we take any kind of an action that that is going to guarantee we're going to become saved because we have to keep in mind there's nothing that we have done that is uh, uh, required to affect our salvation. But sometimes that is not too easy to uh, put down in language, That's especially when you're doing a track where you're trying to keep your words as few as possible because you can't just... Uh, uh, you can't just uh, discuss everything, but I'll take a look. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. You can read Mark 10:45. Mark 10, verse 45. Let's look at that. Mark 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He came not 
the Son of Man came not to minister unto, nor to minister, but to give his life a ransom for many. Now, what is your question? Do you agree with that? Well, it's the, this is what the Bible says. So the Son of Man came to give his life a ransom for many in 33 A.D., right? Oh, no, it doesn't say that now. Now you've read when something did... and, excuse me, the Son of Man, uh, uh, even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Now, he for came originally as the Christ, before the foundation of the world to to actually make the payment for our sins and then he came again uh, uh, when he took on a human nature a second time he came and uh, and we'd have to say a second time because he died he rose from the grave as the, as uh, uh, as the uh, savior and uh, and as the one who had made the full payment for the sins of man, and since by man came death, uh, by man came the resurrection of life, and and so on. Uh, so the fact is that he came again to demonstrate how he had made that payment for our sins. We ha we 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 have to read this verse in the light of all the other verses that relate. Otherwise, we can get a wrong conclusion, namely, that this is the only time he came, when he came uh, to go to the cross. But we know from a lot of other scriptures, no, that was a time when he came to demonstrate how he suffered. And you know, uh, effectively, his going to the cross was a parable. That is, it was a it was a, a physical, a hist a, an earthly thing that he did that we could see with our eyes with a spiritual meaning. It was illustrating what he had done in making payment for our sins. And when Christ spoke in parables, you can't separate the two, uh, the earthly story and the spiritual meaning all are uh, are part of the, are part of the whole the whole message that God is giving. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. Good evening. Yes. Uh, I don't have my Bible. I think it's Mark ten fourteen, uh, about where Jesus says, "Suffer the little children to come to me." Yes. Is that correct? Uh, um, yes, he said in Mark 10, verse 14, He uh, suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Now, what is your question? The, the other day there was a bad car accident down here in Los Angeles where a family ran off the road, unfortunately, and the, and the car overturned and caught on fire, and there were three little children in the car, and they all burned to death. And it seems like God could have prevented them from burning to death, but he didn't. So apparently he, it's okay for children to burn to death when God could have helped. So when Jesus says, suffer the little children to come to me, does he mean like, I want those little kids to suffer, and that's how they're going to come to me. I'm going to make them suffer and burn to death, and I don't really care, and that's how I like them to come to me. Well, you're reading a lot of things into that that the Bible doesn't uh, indicate. First of all... Christ spoke in parables, and he typifies the true believers as little children. We are very humble. We are very naive as a little child. And in the Bible says, except you become as one of these, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. This is, this is the nature of a child of God. We're, we, we don't carry on. We don't walk in our pride. We don't carry on big pre. Uh, pretenses of being somebody important we just recognize that uh, very naively we want to trust God and only only him uh, we have to be like little children secondly uh, there are uh, there might be those who think that salvation after all is only for grown people I remember when I grew up uh, sometimes the uh, the parents would meet together for coffee after church or whatever, 
and the children were kind of disregarded as if they didn't really amount to much and uh, really the focus was on what the older people were doing and talking about and yet we have to realize that a little child can become saved is just as important in God's kingdom as any adult and we must never 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 treat them as second-class citizens uh, they stand on the same ground they need salvation just like the adult now insofar as how we die we if we if we die unsaved uh, that's that's just the end of our life we never recognize that we have we're under the judgment of our God and maybe that little child just like a, a, a grown person uh, had enjoyed life to some degree up until that point and and came to a very uh, uh, cruel end uh, but then they're dead and there's no more suffering in fact it's probably a lot uh, a lot uh, I, when I think if you go to a children's hospital and you see little youngsters that are in traction and have uh, all kinds of bandages on them because they've been operated and operated and operated on, you really feel sorry for them. They are suffering, but that's because this is a world of suffering. We can expect that. Uh, it, it has nothing to do with, with the fact that that child is a sinner or not. It's just the fact that this is the kind of world we live in. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, man, how's it going? Uh, I got a quick question. You're talking about uh, children, if they're being banished or sinners or something like that? Can children become saved? Is that your question? No, nah, you just said, like, sinner, uh, children were sinners because they are being wrapped in bandages or something like that. Well, let's, when we talk about children, let's start out with Psalm uh, 58 because that kind of sets the record straight right at the beginning. We read in Psalm 58, uh, we're uh, in verse 3. Now, we read in Romans, there is none righteous, no, not one. It's talking about every human being by nature is dead in his sins and, and needs salvation. And that includes children. Look at what it says in Psalm 58, verse 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. In other words, a child is, uh, is dead in his sins just as an adult. That child... Uh, if he has been chosen by God and if God had paid for the sins of that child, well, then at some time in that child's life, either as a little baby or it could be an hour before he dies, he will uh, become, uh, he will be given a new resurrected soul and uh, he will receive his glorified spiritual body, his resurrected body, on the day of of uh, the rapture uh, that but children stand on exactly the same ground as parents but thank right. you thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum Zechariah 14 6 and 7 Zechariah 14 verse 6 and 7 there we read uh, and this is kind of difficult language. Uh, the translators didn't do too well. It shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear, and what it really means in the original language will not be, uh, pr uh, will not, uh, it'll come to pass in that day that the light shall not be precious. That is, there will be a great amount of salvation. Uh, and then it says, not dark. And that should read, uh, it, it will be congealed, or it will be made uh, 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 solid. In other words, it's light that will never go away. In other words, God here is anticipating 
the rapture. When we become raptured, we are in the light of Christ forevermore. It can never diminish at all. And it is available and it's in copious in great amounts for every true believer that has, uh, has been raptured. This is what is being talked about. And uh, that is why it says at evening time there shall be light. It, this is all to be understood spiritually. There is no darkness anymore. Now today we have light when someone is a true believer and he's beginning to get, have some understanding of the Bible and uh, that, uh, that, uh, that means he's in the light. Whereas those who may think they're saved and yet they are not listening to the whole Bible, they don't have that great an interest in the Bible, uh, they just uh, trust in their church or in their in their confessions or in their what uh, uh, their water baptism or whatever. Well, for them, they still are in spiritual darkness, and uh, and uh, so there's light and there's darkness. But once we get to the time of the rapture, there's no darkness with those who claim to be believers. Uh, but on the other hand. And those who are thought they were saved and are not, they are in total darkness forevermore. They are in, a, in the great in the day of judgment when the final punishment will come upon them. Is that talking about the new earth? It's talking about at the time that there is the the God is ready to bring to pass the new heaven and the new earth. Zechariah 14 is focused on that period going from this earth to the new heaven and the new earth. And so the language is somewhat complicated. Can you also look at Isaiah 30, verse 26? Isaiah 30, verse 26. There we read... And uh, there shall be upon every high mountain and upon every high hill rivers. Or oh, let's hold on for a moment. I'll read this right after this message. We have a caller who's asked a question about Isaiah chapter 30, verse 26. Let me read 25 and 26. They really go together. And there shall be upon every high mountain and upon every high hill rivers and streams of water in the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall. Now, when is the day of the great slaughter? When the towers will fall. All those who are the great ones of the world or who think they are great or whatever, uh, when will that great slaughter occur? That is the day of judgment. That is the day of judgment. And at the same time, that will also be the day of the rapture. Now, before that time, right, we're living just a, just a uh, very short period before that time, as a matter of fact, uh, less than two years, and that time will be here. But at this time, we, we uh, don't see the gospel in all of its clarity. It is still, there are things that confuse us. We, we don't know who, we have no idea who the true believers are. Only God can see the heart of man. We don't know the full glory of having a new resurrected body, as we will on the, on the, on the first day of the day of judgment, when, which also coincides with the rapture. Uh, in other words, uh, well, there's a lot of things about the gospel that, that we still don't know, even though God has opened our eyes in a powerful and wonderful way in these last months and the last few years. But the fact is that at the time of the rapture, the sun and the moon are going to be fantastic. Now, it's not talking about the physical sun. It's not talking about the physical moon that we're looking at. Those are still going to be shining just as they are now, they're going to shine like that all the way through the the uh, day, the time of it, of the day of judgment, which will go on for 
uh, five months from the first day of the day of judgment. But spiritually, remember, Christ spoke in parables. Without a parable, he did not speak. The, the moon represents the law of God. And the sun represents uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, who rises with healing in his wings. And at the time of the rapture, the sun and the moon will be fantastic because we will see the law of God come to its final conclusion in a wonderful way as, the, as we see uh, the completion of our own salvation uh, so that no longer are we mixed up in any way at all. We see, we are, uh, we are seeing Christ. And at the same time, we will see the wrath of God, which is the other side of the gospel. It is a savor of life unto life and of death unto death. And we will see it uh, being doing its final work of the day of judgment. And so the moon will be brilliant. The law of God will be brilliant. And the sun will, the, the Christ, in all of his glory, all that he has talked about in the Bible, now will be a, a bright and shiny uh, because our salvation is 100% completed. We now are with Christ forevermore. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, how are you today? Yeah, go ahead with your call. Uh, I have a question about uh, salvation. Yes. So God has already decided who's going to be saved and all that? He not only has decided, he already uh, chose. Uh, God is God. He knows the end from the beginning. And uh, uh, before he ever created this world, there wasn't one human being created yet because we weren't created till the sixth day of creation. But uh, mankind... Uh, came into existence with the creation of Adam and Eve. Uh, but before that creation, God already knew every human being that eventually would come to life when he did create this world, and he ch chose certain ones, according to his own choice, to uh, become saved, because God knows the end from the beginning. He knew that mankind would fall into sin and as a matter of fact he knew every sin that these individuals would commit and those sins already were laid upon Christ before he ever created the world now with Christ loaded with those sins uh, he had to bear the penalty of the law of God and the law of God called for death and so Christ had to die this is all very mysterious because Christ never ceased to be the eternal God. And you mean that eternal God had to die? Yes, yes. Eternal God died. That's why we read in the Bible, as it talks about this, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, that is, in the grave. Uh, Christ was there, uh, at, and this all happened before the world began. All right, then he rose uh, from the grave, and now uh, he uh, is called the Son of God because he, has, uh, he is the firstborn. Uh, he had a beginning in that sense that he could uh, be called the, uh, 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 the Son of God. When he died for our sins, he was not the Son of God. He died as Christ, as God himself. But now as the Son of God, he's still God himself. But now he can be, that's why he's introduced to us. Uh, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now, and, and, and therefore, everyone in the world, as they come into the world, God already has decided who he's not, who he plans to save and has already done the salvation for them. All he has to do now is prepare them to live with him forever in eternity future, and that is he 
at the moment that we say that we become, or we know we have become saved, we've received a new uh, soul, a brand new soul, and uh, so that we now have eternal life in our soul. We'll never die uh, in our soul existence. And then on the last day, we'll also receive our resurrected body, which is eternal in character. And so we will be completely uh, ready to spend eternity with Christ in the new heaven and the new earth. So people that haven't been saved could potentially be saved because God already knew what was going to happen. And people that may think they're saved may not be saved because God didn't choose them. Is that right? Well, the fact is uh, God is has done all the work and he made all the decisions. We can choose him, but that doesn't mean he has chosen us. We can, uh, mankind, a lot of people, like right today in the world, there are a couple of billion people who call themselves Christians. They they believe they're saved. They have chosen uh, to be a child of God. But nobody can become a child of God just by... Uh, it, 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 it's only if God has done all the work to save that individual. However, we must bear in mind that God is not really doing a disservice to the unsaved of the world uh, because uh, people uh, uh, who, ha especially those who have tried to live uh, uh, the way the Bible teaches, even though they were not chosen at all, uh, they uh, uh, they have tried to keep the law of God as best they can. And the law of God, that is what everything the Bible teaches about not committing adultery and not lying and not stealing and loving your father and mother and and uh, and uh, so on and walking very humbly and in a measure that people do those things they really have had a very enjoyable life in this world they have enjoyed their flower garden and they've enjoyed health and they have enjoyed uh, friendships and so on and they die maybe thinking that they're going to uh, wake up in heaven but they die, and that's the end of it. They never realize that they're deprived of the new heaven and the new earth, but that isn't a suffering to them because they never knew that they were deprived of that. So this world has been really very good. God has been very merciful. Sending The Bible speaks about sending the sunshine upon the just and the unjust and, and the rains, that the benevolent rains, you know, that make the crops grow and so on but uh, however in this day when God is particularly making sure that everybody hears his command that judgment day is here God wants everybody to hear that and those who disregard that uh, uh, who now pay no attention to what the Bible is saying they will have a short period of time of terrible, terrible punishment. Uh, for example, one of the greatest punishments that is going to come to those who are in the churches who fondly believe that when they die, they're going to be with Christ forevermore. They're the ones that are going to be raptured. And because they're not listening to the whole Bible, they, they, are not, they really are, are not saved at all. They're going to be in a terrible dismay, terrible spiritual suffering as they see others caught up to be with Christ and they're left behind. That's why we read again and again, like in the Gospel of Matthew, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is, gnashing of teeth means they're angrily yelling at God, crying out, How come? Uh, we were such fine people in the church. We, I was a preacher, I was an elder or whatever, and how come I am left behind? And then the Lord will effectively tell them, I never knew you. That is, you were trusting in your work to get saved. You are not trusting in the Bible the way a true believer would have. But so we really have no choice. So um, no matter what we do, really, we well, can't. We, uh, like, 
We ne- okay. no, no one what's ever. What's going to happen? Not, you're correct. We have no choice. We have we uh, uh, we don't deserve a choice. We we uh, the Bible says that right at the beginning, God created our where we all came from. We're all from the blood of Adam. He was created in the image of God. So in principle, because we come from His bloodline, we were created in the image of God, and and we were warned that in the day you eat of that tree or in the day you disobey me, you're going to die. You're going to come to spiritual death. Even though you might live physically a while, there will be spiritual death, and that will result in physical death in time. And uh, and uh, that is the, the condition of every human being. We don't deserve the mercy of God at all. We don't, right from the beginning. In fact, uh, we're born with a rebellion in our hearts. We're, we're, we, uh, we want our way. We think we're smarter than God. The Bible really emphasizes that. We walk with pride. God warns again and again about how proud we are. So we don't deserve, we don't deserve the mercy of God. And yet God is such a fantastically wonderful, merciful God that he has provided this wonderful world for people to live in and to die and so they don't even they don't even know that they experienced the wrath of God even uh, uh, they just die and that's the end of it they have no more conscious existence oh my what a wonderful God he is but uh, and of course if they have been living in uh, uh, lying and cheating and stealing and committing adultery and so on the likelihood is their life in this world was not very pleasant at all. They ran into all kinds of special problems and troubles. But, but uh, uh, the fact is, they die, and that's the end. They, they, they know they, there's no more punishment, except in this day, in this day, when God is making certain that people do know what the Bible is saying, God, it's like in the days of, of Noah. God made sure that people of that day knew when the flood waters would come. Or in the days of Jonah, in the book of Nineveh, God made sure that the people of Nineveh knew the day they were to be destroyed. And you know, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And today He is making sure that the world and every human being knows when the time is coming. And so if they, if anyone happens to be alive yet on May 21, 2011, they will enter into that horrible, horrible event of the Day of Judgment. They may be killed in that massive earthquake that will occur the first day when millions of people undoubtedly will die uh, and death will be everywhere. They may have lived uh, one day or two days or five days or they might live... 153 days and then finally be uh, completely destroyed with the, as the whole universe is completely destroyed on that day. So then we're being punished for someone's sins that was prehistoric. That doesn't seem very merciful, does it? We are punished for someone else's sin. No, not at all. It's our sin. It's our sin. But didn't Adam and Eve c- or commit the sin with the, eating the, tr- the fruit but from the tree not, of knowledge? We're not, sir. We're not punished because they sinned. They had to pay the penalty for their sin. They came under the wrath of God. How does every baby come from the womb? In rebellion against God. That the, uh, the, uh, the evidence is there that I am a sinner. And it's our, in the Bible it tells us that assures us it's a fundamental principle of the Bible that the son is not uh, suffering or paying the penalty for the sin of the father Adam had to pay for his sin you and I have to pay for our sin even though Adam was our father we don't the Bible makes a big point of the fact that the son does not pay for the sin of the father or the father pay for the sin of the son we each pay for our own sin and the fact if if someone could be born and uh, and never commit a sin 
then they wouldn't be punished. But the fact is, we all do sin. But thank you for calling. And But the wonder of it all is, we don't want to lose this. The wonder of it all is, God assures us that right today, God makes a point of this, that right today, we know it's right today, there are many, many people becoming saved. Uh, most of these are those who know very little about the gospel, just like the people of Jonah. They didn't know anything about Christ. They didn't know uh, very much at all about what the Bible was teaching. Uh, but they did know that God meant what he, w what he said, and they, and they trembled before God. And God, in his mercy, did decide to save them. And so today, as for those who tremble before God, uh, they, there is a possibility that they too might, be the, might become saved. But we, we uh, n what the Ninevites did or what we do does not make the difference. What makes the difference is whether, uh, whether God has, because he finally is orchestrating the whole business. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. Yes, welcome to Open yes. Forum. Uh, what is a concordance? A concordance is, uh, there are two of them, or there are more than two, but there are two that are particularly uh, uh, good. One is Strong's. Concordance, strong, just think of strength, strong's concordance, and the other is called Young's concordance. Now, what they are is uh, they're like a dictionary. Uh, uh, if we look in our Bible, in our English Bible, and we see, let's say, in the Old Testament, the word faith, or any word, we see the word uh, uh, ship, or whatever it is. And we, uh, we wonder, uh, we uh, search the Bible, and we find that the Hebrew word that was translated faith may have been translated three or four or five uh, different ways in the Bible, but we can't tell from our English Bible. But when we go to the concordance, uh, we look at that verse and to look at a word that we're interested in. Let's say it's the word faith. And we can go to the concordance and find the word faith and find every other place in the Bible where that same Hebrew word is used. And uh, we may find that in some places it was translated as believe or some places translated as, as uh, trust. Uh, but if, if it's the same Hebrew word, it, is, it has the same meaning in wherever it is used. And... And so it is a super dictionary that helps us to know where, uh, where all the verses are that use a particular word that we're interested in as we are trying to understand a verse. We want to see how does God use this particular word and that particular word in this verse elsewhere in the Bible because the Bible is also its own dictionary and interpreter as we see how God used it elsewhere, it'll help us understand how God used it in this verse. But And you can buy a concordance for 25 or $30, something like that. It's not that expensive, even though it's a very big book. And, uh, and, uh, but it, <laughs> you have to learn to use it, and, and it, uh, it, it is, uh, it, it, uh, but it is very valuable. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, how are you today, Mr. Camping? Very well, thank you. Uh, can we go to Matthew chapter 18, verse 3? Matthew 18, verse 3. Matthew 18, verse 3. We read there and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Okay, my question is, uh, with that being said, um, 
out of the Bible. Uh, children are innocent, so how can they not be saved from the wrath of God? Well, excuse me, where does it say that children are innocent? That is a philosophy, philosophical but from statement. Reading to, from reading what chapter, verse 3 said, is almost saying that, well, if you don't become like a little kid, which sin, sin is what gets us into now, wait hell, a minute. right? It, it says so, become like little children. Uh, that is, we become uh, sons of our heavenly Father. We become children in Christ's kingdom. But we ha remember the biblical principle that we compare spiritual things with spiritual. And so before we arrive at a final conclusion concerning any verse of the Bible, however uh, plain and clear that appear verse appears to be, we have to take into account anything and everything else that the Bible says that relates to that verse. And I, where I read from Isaiah 58, where it says that the children go astray from their mother's womb, speaking lies, and that also has to be factored in. How do you, how do you uh, harmonize that with this? And you see, little children are not innocent. They are any more. In fact, God uses the figure of a poisonous viper. Take a rattlesnake, for example. Here's Mama rattlesnake. Oh my, she's. Uh, uh, we're frightened of that because if she bites me, I, it could be a deadly wound. Now, she gives birth to, uh, she lays a bunch of eggs, and after a little while, the eggs hatch, and here squirms out of those eggs little baby rattlesnakes. Oh, aren't they cute? Aren't they neat? Oh, I'd like to have one of those for a pet. Forget it. They're rattlesnakes. They're exactly like mama. And they are just as dangerous. We cannot compare ra kids to rattlesnakes. I mean, they're innocent. They don't know. That's why the parents got to be their guarding until they're old enough to understand better. So how can you compare children to rattlesnakes? E excuse me. That is a faulty, false uh, doctrine that churches teach. Uh, because it has absolutely no truth in it whatsoever. They cannot turn anywhere in the Bible to teach that. That is a theological conclusion that they have arrived at because they understand that uh, that uh, uh, the wages of that there's eternal damn or they had been taught that damnation is forevermore and they're, they're going to be suffering forevermore and they can't stand it to think of these little children uh, spending eternity in a place called hell so they came up finally with that kind of a false idea that they are innocent well they're not innocent and neither is there going to be a punishment that goes on forever and ever that also is false but thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Thanks, Harold, for taking my call. Uh, Mr. Camping, I'm a long-time listener and a very faithful supporter of Family Radio. I have a statement to make, and I ask that you please let me make it. Uh, every day, Family Radio, down here I listen to WKDN, every day and every night, Family Radio continues to advertise for America's Keswick. Now let me finish. I've checked this out myself. This is an, organiza an organization that's full of church people. Pastors go there and speak. TV evangelists go there and speak. It's made right, up right. of many little ministries. Right, Money is collected. Excuse me. Excuse Please. me. I got the message, but uh, but let's not. Uh... Uh, let's see. Now, what is your question? I, well, I, I can't I, get a hold of you on the phone in the daytime, and I can't write you a letter, and I just uh, it's very confusing. Yeah, okay, all right. Now, you made your point, but this that's not the nature of this program. I know that, and I apologize to you right. and the well, listeners, now, but there's now. no other way to get a hold of you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. And shall we take our next call? Please, welcome to Open Forum. Welcome. Can you, hear, me? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I, I hear you fine. Ask, I wanted to ask you a question about uh, Jesus being the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. Yes. 
And uh, we find with believers that when they're saved, as they live out their lives, they're saved spiritually first. Then at the time of the resurrection, uh, most of the believers will gain their uh, resurrected bodies to go along with their resurrected spirits, right? Well, so, uh, now, we have to define believer. You know, all, there are, according to the World Almanac, there are about two billion people, about one third of the world's population, that really believe in Christ, that believe that they uh, are safe in the arms of Christ. And yet, they're, if they're still in a church, they are blatantly rebelling against God. They are not listening to the law of God and wanting to obey it. Hold on, I'll be right back with you. The question is, what is a true believer? The definition that we normally have been taught in the churches is that a true believer believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, now, that is a true statement, except that is his belief a result of the fact that God has saved him, or is that uh, the thought expressed as a fact that because that person had some trust in Christ, therefore he became saved. And if it's the latter situation, that person absolutely is not saved. Uh, it is true that when we have become saved, we do have a profound trust in, and a desire to be obedient. That's why we read in 1 John chapter 2, uh, in verse 4, where God is defining of salvation if we he that saith I know him that is I believe in Christ as my savior and keepeth not his commandments is a liar that is if he is uh, not trusting or not have an intense desire to be obedient to all the law of God and, uh, and, and so that the Bible is really a, an enormous authority in his life uh uh, the truth is not in him, but whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Now in our day, when all kinds of truth, truth is pouring out of the Bible, uh, this is the Bible that every true believer ought to have an intense respect for he should tremble before it because it is the word of God and yet uh, all kinds of people who are sure that they are true believers are paying no attention to the fact that we know we indeed are living in a day when we can know the time of the end and for those who don't know yet Christ is going to come as a thief in the night. That is, they're still in spiritual nighttime. This is the time when they should know that Satan is ruling in the congregations. And therefore, it is a dangerous place to be that there is no salvation any longer. Almost all the people who call themselves Christians historically are paying no attention they're paying no attention, so they're not ready to keep the commandments of God. They simply are keeping the commandments of their theology or of their congregation or of their confession or what their pastor is teaching. They're not listening to the whole Bible. The nature of a true believer is that we tremble before the Word of God. And if we hear that uh, that... Uh, there is something else that we could learn from the Word. We're going to be intensely interested in it because we uh, that's, that's God's Word, and we want to make sure we are being as faithful as possible. But the, but the, the true believers then, the true believers, they are saved spiritually first, and then out on the day of the rapture, their salvation is completed because they gain, um, they gain their spiritual bodies uh, right? That's correct, right? That's correct. And so uh, what I'm wondering is, I, I, when I study out the idea that Jesus is the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world, I personally can't find any verses that teach he took on a human nature at that time. 
So I was wondering if it's possible that Jesus is, himself is following the same pattern he establishes in his salvation program for people. That is, that he spiritually died before the salvation of the world first, and then at the time when he of his nativity and incarnation, he took on a human nature at well, that time. We, we can speculate about that, but God says it very plainly, and we don't understand this, of course. But he says it very plainly in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 21. For since by man came death, by man also the resurrection of the dead. Now Christ is the firstborn, the first one to rise. By man came the resurrection of the dead. So he had to take on a human nature before he, at the time he was laden with our sins, and died that is long before creation now we if we try to understand that we're going to get into trouble right away we cannot understand an infinite God any more than we can understand that the Bible insists again and again there is one God and yet God clearly reveals himself as three distinct persons the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit. We can't understand that. We accept it as a fact. But uh, this verse in 1 Corinthians 15 uh, 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 makes all kinds of sense, that he, he came to pay for the sins of man, and therefore he had to become man to be a, uh, to be a, a fit, uh, a fit uh, substitute. And here it says, as by man came death, so by man came the resurrection of the dead. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, I I got a question about uh, uh, when you're when you're a Christian, do you, you go automatically to heaven, or do you sleep in the grave until Christ come back comes back? Well. Uh, you do both. You see, let's say, let's talk about uh, David or talk about uh, Peter or anybody, uh, uh, someone who died last week who is a true believer. I, in their soul existence, sometime before they died physically, they were given an eternal soul, an eternal spirit essence. Uh, that uh, is their old soul as uh, it no longer exists, and they were uh, become a brand new personality in their soul existence, and in that new soul they were given eternal life. However, their body was still not changed. It's still a body that lusts after sin. It's still subject to physical death. So when that person died, in his soul existence he left his body and went in to heaven to be with Christ. That's why the thief on the cross was told by Jesus, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Paradise is where God is, and uh, it was in his soul existence that the thief would go into paradise. But his body would have been thrown into a grave or a pit or whatever, as whatever they did with criminals. And uh, just as the body of David was buried, or the body of Peter was buried when he died, but it's on the last day of the, uh, the of the uh, of the uh, duration of the gospel that uh, that all of those who became saved, their bodies will be resurrected. There's just a few that are already in heaven. There's Elijah in his body. There's Moses in his body. There's a few that rose right after Jesus rose from the grave. We read about that in Matthew 27. Uh, and Enoch, we know that God took him at the age of 365. But except for that little handful, every other person all the way from Abel uh, because we know that uh, he had become saved all the way from Abel to uh, the last individual who became saved will receive their glorified spiritual body uh, simultaneously. But so this comes back, the dead in Christ will rise first. So, so the so 
the Christians that are up in heaven, they're going to come back and then they're going to go in the grave and then no. come back up no, to be no. with Christ again, no. or, or what? No, excuse me, no. In their soul, they are with Christ. In their body, they're in the grave. The dead in Christ, that is, they are the ones who died, but they are in Christ. They are in two places after they died. In their soul existence, they're with Christ. In their body, they're in the grave. And so the dead in Christ will rise, that is, their body will be resurrected, a glorified spiritual body. And, and at the same time, we who live, who are true believers at that moment, we read in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, will not all sleep, that is, will not all die first, but will all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And so simultaneously, when the graves are thrown open and the bodies are resurrecting, the true believers that are living on the, earth, in the, on the planet Earth at that time will also be instantly changed into a glorified spiritual body and caught up with them, with these bodies that came out of the grave. There will be one resurrection of all of those who God had ever saved. But thank you for calling and sharing, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening. Uh, my question is, God says we ought to be raised at the last trumpet in 1 Corinthians 15:52. How can we be raised at the fifth trumpet where Revelation 9, 1 to 5, which is the beginning of the five months? Well, it's really talking about uh, two different things. Uh, we're resurrected uh, at the sound of the last, uh, although, although, uh, you know, all the events, in fact, they are really the same trumpet because the uh, seven trumpets blow uh, at the moment of the day of judgment uh, that introduces us to all the horrors in Revelation uh, that are expressed concerning the day of judgment. And that also is the time when, when that begins, that, that the rapture also begins. So really they're one and the same. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, hi. Uh, how do you know... You sit and say how the how you believe that the book of Daniel has been opened, and uh, how do you know that these books have not been written today, and they're not, and they haven't been uh, published, well, or they haven't been opened yet. Well, because of the nature of the Bible, as you study the Bible and study the Bible, you learn certain, uh, certain uh, principles or certain truths. And one of the things is the Bible frequently try, talks about write it in a book or write it in a scroll. Uh, that was an Old Testament way of speaking of the book. Write it, uh, write it in a book or write it in a scroll. And uh, and uh, like uh, when Jeremiah was uh, g given, God was speaking to Jeremiah, he had his secretary Baruch write it in a book or in a scroll, and uh, and that always was the Bible. On the other hand, uh, the Bible does occasionally talk about some other book, like the book of Jasher. Well, now we know that that's not part of the Bible, because the book of Jasher is not in the Bible anywhere. And uh, we find that uh, 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 name, uh, another name like that uh, on a few occasions. But if it's just saying, write it in the book, we know the book is the Bible, like in the book of Esther, uh, for example. And we read that Esther and Mordecai wrote it in the book, and that was the last writing of the Old Testament. Now, we get to the New Testament, and we find that there is a book that has been written, both sides. It was filled, and it's sealed with seven seals, and nobody was there to open it. Well, what is that? Well, it has to be the Bible, because that is the book. 
And then we read that Christ uh, uh, opened the book, and it was completely open. Uh, as we read in Revelation 8, 1, which we now know was talking about the first day of the Great Tribulation, that final 23-year period which we're, to which we're now coming to an end. Camping, you have a big uh, world of waiting. I mean, uh, you do not believe what is going to take place. The whole world is not like you say. And in the end, it's going to be a beautiful place. Well, excuse me, you have to justify that conclusion from the Bible. You have to, you have to take it, excuse me, you have to take into account, remember this, you not only have to find a verse here or there that seems to indicate this world will be a beautiful place, but you also have to take into account all of the verses, and there are many of them, that have to do with that, the fact that this earth is going to be completely destroyed. For example, you have to take into account what God, because the whole Bible is from the mouth of God, and you can't pick and choose and say, I like this verse and not that verse. In Second Peter chapter 3, God says that... Uh, uh, in verse 10, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Now, uh, you, how are you going to justify that in the light of your conclusion? You see, in other words, uh, we, can, we can think we know a whole lot. And uh, because we've found a verse here or there. But the fact is, God is infinite in His wisdom. He has written a book, the Bible, uh, give, indicating, and it's written from the wisdom of God. Therefore, we stand very respectful. We stand very much, uh, very meekly before it. And, oh, Lord, I don't know anything. You teach me. And so how... Well, what are you going to do with this verse here in Second Peter 3? You have to answer that. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall and, we take... Uh, yes. Go, we're going to our next caller. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, sir. How are you doing tonight? Very well, thank you. Hey, I'm calling from Honolulu, Hawaii, over here in the ocean. and i got a really interesting question for you. If you would, could you take a look at Isaiah 38, 13? Isaiah 38, verse 13. Yes, sir. There we read. Isaiah 38, verse 13. I reckon to... Uh, uh, let's start with verse 11. This is Hezekiah, King Hezekiah. He's sick unto death. And uh, he said... I shall not see Jehovah, even Jehovah, in the land of the living. I shall behold man no more with the inhabitants of the world. My age is departed and is removed from me as a shepherd's tent. I have cut off uh, like a weaver my life. He will cut me off with pining sickness from day even to night. Wilt thou make an end of me? Now verse 13. I reckon till morning that as a lion, so will he break all my bones. From day even to night wilt thou make an end of me. Uh, and, and he goes on uh, in verse eight, 16. O oh Lord, by these things men live, and in all these things is the life of my spirit. So wilt thou recover me and make me to live. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Now, what is your question? My question is, what's interesting, it, it, it almost seems like this is a picture of what Christ is going through before the foundation of the world. And it's interesting how God uses the term, so will he break all my bones from day even to night, without making an end of me. Excuse me, Christ did not have his bones broken. You remember that when they 
ate the para the the uh, Passover feast. They were not to break the bones when they when Christ was demonstrating how he suffered, and they came through uh, to break the bones of the people, uh, the men hanging there to hasten their death by sundown. Uh, they did break the bones of the th two thieves next to him, but not Christ. They did not break his bones. This is not talking about Christ at all. It's talking about mankind looking at us first from a human vantage point. Oh, I wish I could continue in this world. Oh, 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 it's, it's so sad that I have to die. Because after all, as I indicated earlier, God has made this a very pleasant place for those who have been trying to follow the law of God and Hezekiah certainly had been and now he's going to die but then when we go on a little farther we see that where God begins to give us interpretation oh Lord by these things men live and in all these things is the life of my spirit so wilt thou recover me and make me to live in other words it's in my spirit in my soul and I have to look at this whole business spiritually and not physically. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. Uh, I um, I listen to you like almost every day. Uh, I'm Christian. My daughter is not Christian, and she has three kids, three babies. I'm very sad about those babies if uh, they are not safe. You know what I mean? Um, I've been reading the Bible for several years, and I understand that the parents don't pay for the sins of the kids. I hear a man asking you about the babies, and you mm, you were like kind of like com comparing the baby, I mean the people with vipers, and we're not vipers we are children of god according to what i read in the bible and i'm very sad that you're saying that the kids are also under the wrath of god Babies well, I, are I, 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 i'm sorry i'm sorry you may not like what god is saying but i didn't write this in psalm 58 i these are not my words these came from the mouth of almighty god he says in verse 3, the wicked are estranged from the womb. Uh, and, and that ties in with there's none righteous, no, not one. So little children, they can look innocent in our eyes, but in God's sight, they are wicked. But here is the promise. You can pray for your children and your grandchildren. You, you, uh, God can save a baby just as easily as he can save an adult. It doesn't depend on on what we do it depends on God's action and if it's and if, if if as we pray and beseech the Lord it may be that God may save one or more of your children and grandchildren but uh, but uh, it, we must never take the position of of telling God that babies are innocent that is just that is just saying to God we know more than you do. We're brighter than you. And that's a horrible rebellion against God because the Bible is the Word of God. Read Psalm 58 very carefully. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. How are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question about the uh, how to be saved, because as you're saying, that you cannot be saved by your deeds, by your you know beliefs and stuff. So what is the point of your teaching if we can do nothing to be saved because God decided already who is going to be saved? What is the point? Like you know, point is, what what can we do if we can do nothing about it? Well, the point is that salvation is altogether God's business we can pray oh Lord is it possible could it be that I might be saved but I have to wait upon you I know that and myself I cannot make any contribution I certainly would like to become saved but oh Lord I have to wait upon you altogether 
and uh, and I'm going to keep beseeching and begging and begging and God wants us to do that that's what it means to sit in sackcloth and ashes to be weeping before God oh God have mercy like we read for example in the book of Joel in the book of Joel we read in um, in uh, verse chapter chapter uh, um, 2 chapter 2 uh, the jo- in verse 11 Jehovah shall utter his voice before his army for his camp is very great for he is strong and executeth his word for the Lord is for Jehovah is great and very terrible and who can abide it he's talking about the day of judgment Therefore, also now, saith Jehovah, turn ye, he's talking to you and me now and to the whole human race, turn ye to me with all your heart, with fasting, that is, uh, with uh, 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 afflicting yourself, uh, that is, to quit looking for things that is pleasing to you, uh, you just do it God's way, with weeping and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments, that is, it isn't. You, you don't don't try to show me how how uh, uh, superficially how you are broken before me. But you come to me uh, with a real broken and a contrite heart. Then he says, "For he is gracious and merciful." This came from the mouth of God, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth? if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him. That is, who knows whether you might still become saved. That's God's business. We just come creeping up to him. Oh, God, I know. Remember the publican of Luke 18? He smote his breast, and he dared not look up. He was broken. He knew he was a sinner. He knew he deserved the wrath of God, and yet he dared to plead, Oh God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And that's the way we come. We don't come with, you know, I figured it all out. If I do this and I do that, I know you will save me. No way. We come to him as sinners, recognizing we don't deserve sin, deserve salvation at all. Oh God, have mercy. And maybe, maybe, I too might become saved. I have to wait upon you. And we keep waiting and keep waiting and keep pleading. We, uh, of course, live in a day when we uh, have instant pudding. We we begin to pray, Oh, Lord, have mercy, and please save me. Uh, If not today, maybe by next week or at least a month from now. No way. We come pleading, even though we might be pleading right up till a day before the day of the rapture. But we wait upon God, and maybe he will save. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you.